Thanks for listening to The Adam Carolla Show on Podcast One. All right, first half, we talked to one of the most interesting guests we've spoken to in a long time, Matthew B. Crawford. He's written books, but he's got a Ph.D. in political philosophy from the University of Chicago, and has, has so many deep and interesting thoughts that are so pertinent to where we are right now as a society. So please listen and enjoy. First, I'll tell you about True Nigen. I've been taking cellular health vitamin called the True Nigen for, uh, it's been, uh, it's good. We're coming on about five months now. I feel great. I'm not letting any of this stuff affect me. Drew's been taking True Nigen for, God, several years now. As we get older, our bodies experience a near 50% decline in NAD, which negatively affects the health of our cells and then the health of our body. Lifestyle stressors like intense exercise, lack of sleep, stress on the immune system, uh, over overeating. They also deplete uh, NAD because cells uh, expend more energy to function. You need to take care of yourself, especially now. This stuff is backed by Nobel Prize winning scientists, clinical research, and global regulatory approvals. If you're getting a little older, you need to rebuild. You need True Nigen. Support cellular energy and defense. Visit T-R-U-N-I-A-G-E-N.com. Use the code ADAM. Get 20 bucks off any three-month plus supply through July 31st. From Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, New York Times bestselling author Matthew B. Crawford. With Gina Grad on news, Bald Bryant on sound effects, and Dave Damashek is here for good sports. And now, celebrating July 4th early before it gets canceled. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get it on mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, right, Gina Grad? That's right. Handball, Brian. <laughs> Paul Bryan doesn't have a sound effect machine on him because he's uh, on uh, semi vacation for for Fourth of July. Yeah, I just wanted to get, got an early start. Christy had a couple of days off, and her brother got in today. Actually, just now he was walking past me behind me. Uh, we're at her parents' place in Balboa Island. God. Are you all so, uh, self quarantining? We are. It's the only. It's the six of us, and you know, the actually, yeah, they all got tests within the last week. So oh, wow. really helpful. Uh, nice. Be nice to have in-laws at a place on Balboa Island, which is oh, amazing. Yeah. How I many... told the story before, yeah. but her, her, Chrissy's grandparents were very, very good with their money, very good with their investments. They bought this house that I'm sitting in right now in like, I think they bought it in like 1970. I want to get it wrong, but it's like 76 for something like $200,000. And of course you can imagine it's worth a lot more than that. They rebuilt it when they retired and here we are. What? Uh, how many homes are on Balboa Island? And, well, Chris oh, will figure it out. Probably Google that. But I'm going to say less than a thousand. There's a bridge, right? Oh, it's, it's a fallen island. Yeah, there's yeah. a bridge on one side, and there's a ferry on the other side that takes you back and forth to the Balboa Peninsula, where they have the the, the um, Ferris wheel and all that stuff. Nice, but no fire, no fireworks this year, I guess. We're hearing. Nope. We're hearing they're all canceled. All canceled. Fourth of July. Right. It's so fitting that the Fourth of July has been uh, canceled. Um, all right, I got. Yes. Can I give you an idea real quick? I don't know mm-hmm. if, uh, if if you have time to do this, Brian, or if you have any interest. But I started panicking. I said, "Well, we have a four-year-old. He's expecting fireworks. Fourth of July is my favorite holiday. I love fireworks. What are we going to do? You know, we can't even buy sparklers." Sparklers are illegal. So really? what are we going to do? So I went on Amazon and I bought a, a giant box of like 300 neon bendable sticks. And so and I told them, we're going to have a rave. We're going to tape them all over ourselves and turn off all the lights and have a, a neon dance party. Oh, I, I'm trying to think of something to do. Um, I think uh, there was a tweet and I think it was – Gina that forwarded that tweet, but maybe that was a Ricky Gervais leaf blower tweet. Yeah. But this is the parrot tweet, yeah. which has kind of been making the rounds <laughs> from Magnum yep. PI. But it's uh Unearthed. Unearthed <laughs> from nineteen eighty three. It's uh you know, Magnum's got a gun 
and uh, a lady has a gun, and the lady evidently has a trained parrot, right? And she she then summons the parrot to attack Magnum, who is holding the gun. And obviously, this is uh, a lot of Hollywood in here, but it's still a real parrot flying at a real guy who's holding a gun, and you. It's 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 a uh, it's a rough draft, a kind of a walkthrough of my attack crow scenario. Yeah. But in a, in a world, look, there's two things. All we talk about is standoff with the guy. You know, it started off as an innocent uh, traffic stop, or this guy was high on bath salts and he's in the street, and and the cops are like, uh, they're like. He didn't have a gun. Why'd you have to shoot him? And then the cops are like, do you know how much damage a sprinkler key could cause to a human body? <laughs> and so there's always that thing. And, and then they fire the bean bag at the guy and it agitates yeah. him. And then they fire the pepper spray. Evidently, pepper spray is not worth the fucking can it comes in, right? All it seems to do is agitate the people it's being sprayed at. And it's, it's like they're spraying creatine at them. They get stronger and they get moody. That's a great movie trope. It's like, I'm, I'm going to take him out with blah, blah. Don't do that. You only make him angry. Right, right. So the pepper spray doesn't seem to be effective. The pepper spray doesn't seem to affect 19-year-old chicks who go to junior college or in flip-flops. <laughs> yeah. Much less guys who played football in high school who are out of their minds on, on, on pills right now. So pepper spray, no good. The non-lethal stuff. You know, then you get out the uh, stun gun and the guy wrestles it away from you and uses it on you. I mean, think about just the concept. The concept is always like, hey, the gun. Hey, they could use the gun on you. Once they get your gun, then then they have a gun and you don't. Or once they get the pepper spray, they wrestle the pepper spray away. You can't wrestle a bird away. That Thank bird you. is either going after your ass or it's not. You can't command the bird like mid-flight. No! <laughs> <laughs> halt! Yes, halt! Hey, uh, Benedict Bernold. All right, and uh, they don't all work. But they, I need Ber- you to Bernedict Arnold. Bernedict. I knew it was in there somewhere. Bernedict <laughs> Arnold. Turn on your master. Turncoat. You you shall be a bird, literally of a different feather. Go after. No, it wouldn't work. And in this clip, it's one parrot going after Magnum. Imagine five of my tacros going after anybody who had a gun. All right, let's, uh, so we'll play the clip. It's an old woman who has some sort of dominion over fowl. The man is mad. He's telling the truth. He's a communist agent. Come to kill you. Dr. Tessa, drop it. It's a helicopter in the air. Well, blow his brains out. Do it anyway. I know. Merlin, attack! Merlin, Merlin, attack! Can't comes. shoot a bird. <laughs> Catch up running down the car. <laughs> Even Magnum can't stave off a bird. It ends up Wait. flies into the chopper blade. There's a bird strike. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Everything on TV. This is like a this is a top five perennial top five television show. Could you imagine what we had to watch back in the day? But oh boy. point is this big bird attacked this guy with a gun he couldn't shoot it because it's hard to shoot a bird flying at you at that speed if you don't have a shotgun and then uh did a pretty good job on that guy's arms i mean uh we used the dogs and we were all sitting around trying to figure out the lethal force and the non-lethal force and too much lethal force or not enough lethal force I don't know, man. Every day that goes by, I'm getting a little more into my attack rows, especially with all these armed sort of standoff, you know, whatever. Think about that uh, couple in St. Louis on the lawn with their guns the other day. What if they had attack rows? That mob could have got that mob moving the other direction real fast, right? No harm, no foul. You want to give them the attack rows? Huh? You want to give them the attack rows? I want to give... (laughs) Any homeowner, any citizen, anybody attack crows. I told you initially, I wanted my own attack crows. They would sit up on the parapet of the building. And when I walked out to the car, if anyone accosted me, boom. And when you go, when you go to the 7 Eleven or the market or the liquor store, they fly as the crow flies. The giant, you have a giant rainbow tape crow sticker on the roof of your car. 
so the crows can understand. Probably doesn't even need to be a crow. Could just be a giant bullseye, you know, just a big, big rainbow tape bullseye. Put it so the crows can see you when they're soaring up there, five hundred feet above the ground. Then when you pull into the liquor store at night, they just land on the parapet. Then when you come walking out, God forbid, some uh, gangbanger costs you, or even a hobo wants money. Boom, right on the head in a flash, and done. So. Uh, Thanks for who found that clip? Is that just making the rounds? Uh, Gina it was, saw it. It was going around. around. But yeah, yeah, it was going around. Like like for, uh, few days. Yes. All right. So uh, there you go. This uh, maybe now. Do you guys think anyone is working on this? The army. Like the, the army traditionally, you know, uses dolphins and whales and mm-hmm. stuff like. It's pretty rich history of us using dogs and police dogs and army dogs and stuff like that. And, and by the way, the stuff people have come up with over the years to experiment on has been insane. Like I said, dolphins used to like plant mines on ships and stuff like that. The only thing I'm wondering is what is the logistics of training crows? Is that possible? They're obviously very intelligent, but I don't know if they're trainable. So. Well, falconers train birds, so they're and they 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 can identify pattern. That's why they're scarecrows. Well, the, the, um, didn't, I, hold on. Didn't we talk about all those stories where they trained them to pick up cigarette butts and trash in the yeah. parks and throw them in the receptacle? Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd, say, I'd say that's pretty trainable. Yep. Don't you think at this point, because of just drones and, and everything being, you know, so so um, uh, electronic that they would consider crows more analog and nobody cares about that anymore, even though they should? I don't know. I, 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 I've thought about this obviously for years, years, decades. I mean, 20 years now I've been talking about this and thinking about it. I'm just like, when there is a guy and he's got a weapon, maybe a knife, and he's standing in the middle of an intersection and there's five cops around him 20 feet away, it's hard to get him to drop that knife. And it's also hard to get the cops not to shoot him if he won't drop that knife. But, uh, I don't know. I like it. I just saw it. I saw Magnum P.I. illustrate it, and I've been re-energized. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. So uh, enjoy that clip. Um, I took a picture of a uh, manhole cover that was so egregious yesterday on my walk. I've seen we've all seen the manhole covers with the stripe going down the middle of it, which drives me insane. And they're a little bit off to one side. And I chalk it up to, well, maybe it's been there for years and cars have been accelerating or braking on it and pivoting it a little bit. But this one, uh, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. This one had the white lines going north and south and the. It was replaced with it going the exact opposite direction. It literally made a cross in the middle of the intersection. It's a white line and a lighter white line, and it's bolted. It has four bolts in it. I was going to say, that's not just uh, workers being in a hurry or a car. No, the thing is bolted down. It was bolted down the wrong way. It's yes. bolted down. It's bolted. It's bolted the wrong way. I know the bolt pattern works the right way because that's the direction it was in when it was painted. There's a. We should point out that the the, the, the bolts like have I don't know we call them grooves like they're not just randomly bolted as though to secure it like there's four uh, notches you know what I mean where the <laughs> bolts would fit and make, it would it would line up perfectly had they just yes. rotated it 90 degrees. They're countersunk as they would say. Aha. Uh-huh. And the stripe is 90 degrees off. So it makes an X marks the spot. And for some reason, there's a dark stripe and a lighter stripe, which makes mm-hmm. it even more egregious. There's two stripes. It's going the opposite way. We just put it up at AdamCarolla.com. People want to say, this. do you guys share this? And and I, people think I'm nuts when I whenever I open my mouth. I 1,000% mean it all the time. If I was in charge of that patch of land, if I was if that's my city or that's my beat, I would want to find out who put this manhole cover back and then I would confront them and I would say, evidently, you have no regard for your job. You just don't care. You either don't care or you're angry. Either either you really are that far checked out or you're super passive aggressive. And this is a fuck you to everyone who travels this highway. Either way, I got to relieve you. Yeah, that's reflective of a general sort of out of it, like you said. And if if. (laughs) 
whoever put that back is so out of it as to not even notice uh, what the, the pre-cut grooves. Like I said, the counter song. How good a job did they do down below? You know what I mean? Down <laughs> well, there, down in that. How good of a job did you do? It's, <laughs> it's like the green M and M's in the rider. If you can't get this, yeah. one, what else are you getting wrong? Yeah, I would. I would do my stupider liar. I would say, look. Either you're so far out of it that you should never handle power tools, which is part of your job, or you've done this intentionally, in which case you're the world's most disgruntled employee and we must let you go. But as I've said in my stand-up act, I would take it a step further. I would call it a national holiday. I would uh, fill the Staples Center. I would bring this guy right down to center court and I would cane his ass. I would cane him and just yell, any other fuck-up city employees want a taste of the cane? I would have Dean Kane do it just because I like the wow. I like the way it rolls off Kane the tongue. Velasquez. And Kane Velasquez. Michael Kane would sit there and applaud. <laughs> That's right. Michael Kane. <laughs> All right. So um, there's that. I also uh, had a... I wanted, I was looking... So we were talking about good times the other day in, in Cabrini Green... And the housing project and the theme song and, and blah, blah, blah. 1974 is when this hits the air. Um, I will play a little of the theme song just because it's because it's fun. Sounds good. From Television City in Hollywood. We got it. We got them. Drew and I used to. This is a long debate on Loveline because it's it's. They say hanging in a in a jawing, but it always sounds like mm. they say hanging in a jawline. No, it's, I thought it's, it's hang, hanging in a chow line. Chow. Oh, hanging in a chow right. line. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, then it sounds like jawline. That's that's that yeah. was the that was hanging in a jawline. Yeah, that was the that was a controversy. Anyway, uh, 1974. So nobody here was born. I was born in 74. Right. I watched Coach Good Times growing up. As a, a four-month-old? <laughs> no, uh, I think it was already in repeats probably uh, yeah. 10 oh, okay. years later. All right. Well, yeah. yeah, but then it doesn't matter when you're born. But who was born first, Good Times or Dawson? And what was that cocktail party? Of born at the same time. <laughs> Dawson ushered Dawson. in good times. Is Dawson May 12th? March. March 12th. I'm going to say Dawson was born first because those, don't those usually debut in the like late spring or summer? Good, t- good times debuted February 8th. February so, 8th. Oh, so they, got you by a month. Good times beat Dawson. So nobody <laughs> here. So my speculation, when I'm trying to put together my thoughts and my calculations, my first is like, I think I'm the only person here who was born when good times hit the air. And technically, that's true. So nobody here was born, except for me, mm-hmm. when uh, good, good times hit the air. So and then I thought. And I watched every episode, and it was just a lot of them hanging out and subsidized government housing, talking about finding a job at the docks, and the economy sucked, and we didn't have any money, and everyone was on welfare and food food stamps and everything. And I thought, okay, so now it's been uh, 45 years, and or 46 years, and uh, no... How much has things changed? And then I, I saw a news story in Chicago, a horrible news story. You got the uh, clip there. Max Zapata, Mike Tobin is a reporter, and I just saw him. I saw this horrible news story out of Chicago a couple days ago. And uh, trying to figure out how much things have changed. Also, you should know, as I was taking my deep dive into Chicago, they had in the last hundred years – not Chicago, but Illinois, 
has had a Democrat and then a Republican and then a Democrat and a Republican, sometimes two in a row and then two in a row. But they've split Democrat Republican in Illinois for 100 years. Kind of wow. interesting, right? Like oh. I, it's it's literally like ten on each side and ten on the others. I was oh. wicking and, and doing the thing. <laughs> so they alternate between corrupt Democrat, corrupt Republican. Yes, corrupt yeah. Democrat. okay, They're notoriously corrupt. Yeah, and I'll tell you a story about the last Republican uh, mayor of Chicago coming up in a second. But first, I'll play this news story. 18 people killed over the weekend, and two of them were children. One, you could say, a baby. Just 20 months old, Sincere Gaston was his name. He was strapped into the car seat in his mother's vehicle. Apparently, there was a gun battle down the street with two other vehicles, and both the mother and the baby were hit by stray rounds. That little baby never stood a chance. That bullet went right through his chest. Uh, One uh, Chicago police officer who handled this case posted on social media that he's never handled anything this difficult in all his time on the Chicago police. PD. Also, uh, 16-year-old, a 10-year-old, I should say, Lena Nunez was in her uncle's uh, second-floor apartment when a stray round came right through the second-floor window and hit her in the head. Chicago's new police superintendent used the phrase evil bastards to describe the gunmen, and he pressed the public to uh, end this code of silence. He says someone in the neighborhood knows who the shooters are. Usually the motivations for the, uh, the gun violence in the bad parts of Chicago is gang wars drugs, money, turf battles, perceived slights over social media, and the endless cycle of vendettas. Over the weekend, a person was picked up for shooting two teenagers because they asked him how tall he was. An extra 1,200 officers are expected to be on the street this 4th of July holiday weekend because historically the gun gun violence has been pretty severe over the 4th of July. Yeah, so not down with defunding the police in in that area, number one. Uh, Number two... It's been 46 years since I was watching a sitcom about how bad that side of Chicago was. and South side. I don't think things have changed that much. Well, it's actually probably a lot more violent than it was back when uh, mm-hmm. John Amos and, and Florida were hanging around in their, in their apartment at Cabrini Green. And you're right, Gina. They didn't say it was Cabrini Green housing, but it was implied that that was the the notion. So, uh, again, my theme is, what do you think government's going to do for you again? I mean, my thing is, uh, let's see if we can get a job, get married, stay married, and get the fuck out of there. That's that's my plan. I don't know. Not sure that the government is doing a great job with it because I feel like, I've given, you know, my whole thing is I gave uh, one time, um, one time when Donnie had his Bronco in the back of the shop, just sort of rusty Hulk, and we'd had to push it around and everything. And at some point I said to him, uh, I need to get the Bronco out of the shop because it's in the way and we're pushing it all over the place. Just park it in the parking lot, put a cover over it. And I said, uh, I'll give you two weeks to get that accomplished. And, of course, he didn't. And I was upset. But if I said, I'll give you 46 years to do that, and it was still there, That's I, on him. I really not have a whole lot of trust in, in the man anymore. Yeah. And I would, I would think about taking care of my own self because I just don't think the government's doing a good job. Well, but, and, and yes. further irony is, I know it was just from last year, but Lori Lightfoot, who's the uh, mayor, she was on the Chicago Police Board. So I thought people voted her in to, like, really kick this into overdrive. But I don't know if that, that that's the case. Well, we're at the point now where some of the shootings over our are, are, are new one, if you heard, like social diss, you know, like right. online. Yeah. Social media beef. Oh, woo. That's uh, that's frightening. So then I started thinking, I know they're Democratic run, but who when is the last Republican run that place? And I. I thought about, I don't know, 25 years or something like that. The last Republican to be the mayor of Chicago, Max Zapata, was what year that you're not putting on here? 1915 to 1923, and then he served from 1927 to 1931. So the last year Chicago had a Republican mayor was 1931. 1931. Like, I would have said, I don't know, since 1977 or something, right? 31. Let's change it up. And then I thought, yeah, could try. I mean, it couldn't hurt. 
uh, what do you got to lose, as uh, the Trumpster said once upon a time. Uh, William Hale Thompson. And do you have and then I started looking down this guy's wiki page and it was awesome. So go ahead. So he was known as Big Bill because he was really fat and really tall. Um, he's uh, one of the most unethical mayors in American history, mainly for his alliance with Al Capone. <laughs> Uh, he was largely respected throughout his career until when he died and they found a couple of safe deposit boxes containing over 1.8 million in cash back in 1944. That was worth 26 million today. Wow. wow. And what year was he born? He was born in 1869. The yeah. last guy, the last Republican to govern Chicago, or to to be the mayor, sorry, of Chicago, was born in 1869. Wow. wow. It was a crazy, uh, it was fun. Anyway, that's uh, some of the upside of the computer is uh, having a few pops and taking a little uh, wiki, <laughs> little wiki walk. Um, Speaking of that, you know the last time Atlanta had a Republican mayor? No. 1879. I found that hard to believe. Wow. It's, uh, I mean, it's obviously true, but that's crazy. Googleable. Yeah. Um. All right. So uh, good times from uh, 46 years ago, everybody. Nobody, nobody envisioned this future. By the way, when I was sitting around in 1974 watching a black and white Zenith television, nobody was sitting around going in the year 2020. 2020 is going to be the Jetsons. Like of there's course. not going to be yeah. housing projects and people shooting each other in the street for no reason. It's going to. I had no idea that this was the future. The future is yeah, like well, pff, same. Yes. Dinner and a pill and hoverboards. That's right. But hoverboards. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. What would Adam today be like if the mafia still had a big presence? Huh? Jason? What would today yeah. be like? Hey, Adam. How's it oh, going? Oh, what would today be like? Sorry. What's going on, uh, Jason? Not much. Gina Bald, how you guys doing? Hey. Hey. Um, now the the reason I uh, I bring that up is Brian the other the other night I was rewatching the movie Gotti, uh, not the John Travolta piece of shit from a couple years uh, ago, but the uh, damn you the uh, the the Armand I love the John Travolta piece of shit. It's so bad. Yeah. Oh, it was awful. One of the worst movies I've ever seen. Um, but uh, at the beginning of that movie, you know, he goes on a little monologue and he says something like, you know, there's anarchy now and there's no respect, no feelings for this country. And he says, you know, five or ten years from now, they're going to wish there was American Costa Nostra, and they're going to wish, uh, they're going to miss John Gotti. And I was thinking, I'm like, you know, these major cities where the mafia used to have a much bigger presence, I wonder how much of this chaos would be going on today if they still had as big a presence. Because, like, you know, Harlem was uh, a much, well, much better for the black community when People like Frank Lucas was there, were there, you know, keeping it clean, aside from the fact that he was, you know, mass producing drugs, of course. But, um, you know, the, the fear of the mafia kept people more in line is, is where my mind was going. Yeah. Oh, you know, here's what I here's what I'm starting to understand. I'm starting to understand that there needs to be a presence and it can be the police and that should be the police, and hopefully it's the police. But if it's not the police, then it'll be some other presence that is keeping some form of order. I'm, I'm starting to learn now is zero presence doesn't work. I think that's that's just chaos. So mm-hmm. I don't think anyone – look, I, 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 I wouldn't draw a big distinction. I don't know. You hear about it with gangs. Like you got the mafia or maybe the Crips or the Bloods or MS-13 or something where you go, you can travel in this part of town safely, but you can't do this and you can't do that because they don't go for this and they don't go for that. Like let's just picture a different country. You know what I mean? Like let's just say you're going to Central America and they went, look, the cartels are here, but they're, you know, they'll leave you alone, but here's what you can't do. And you'd kind of go, okay, I don't like that the cartels are in charge, but that's a form of order. Yeah, it's organized. There's something, there's some, there's something to it. It's the <laughs> chaos. I think it's the chaos that scares us, right? I'd say so. Definitely scares me. Yeah. Yeah, the unpredictable. Where are you? Hey, how close are you to Road Atlanta? <laughs> 
Uh, I'm about. I'm in Augusta. I'm about two and a half hours away. Oh, oh man. Yeah. It's gotta Hang be up a, on yourself. It's got to be a bitch making the drive to <laughs> Road Atlanta every day, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad I I'm glad I don't have to make that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting thought and uh I think when the shit goes down, uh I'll take the cops first, but uh I'll take the mafia second if the shit's really going down. Yes, Dawson. We had a real world example of this uh a couple of weeks ago in Long Beach. Kaylin will put up that's the video. Right. Yes, that's right. Here we go. <laughs> You blow me? Let me get your fucking ass out of here. What the fuck are you talking about? What the fuck are you talking about? Bro, bro. Get your bitch ass out of here. That's the Crips guy. These are Crips from Long Beach chasing Antifa out of the neighborhood. Get your punk asses on. Look at this Long Beach. Thank you, sir. Say something. Say something. Get your... Yeah. Now, better? I don't know. No, I like, but, hey, it's, look, there's a point there. I'm not a huge Crips fan. You know, I'm a blood guy. Oh, oh God. Oh, boy. But, oh, but blood and Scientology. <laughs> Those are what I'm for. But the th- but you see, you kind of go, oh, look, first off, when you see it in a movie, this is my kind of thing. When you see it in a movie, do you like it? And then if you like it, then it then it's good. Like, you know, those movies where they like hang someone over a balcony and they're like, I'm going to drop you if you don't. They're like, OK, OK, I'll tell you. I'll tell Shook you. Knight? Right. <laughs> Shook Knight. <laughs> so if you like the fictionalized account, it's a good thing. Well, when you when you when you cheer for it in a movie, uh-huh. like if you're watching a movie and a bunch of these idiots came into town and these brothers went, hey, get out of here. And they tried to run. You'd be going, oh, good. And that's that would, it would have, that's what it'd be intended for. Anyway, uh. If if you ever want a good like a fun bad watch, the John Travolta Gotti movie is fucking terrible, but it's so fun. Better or worse than The Dirt, which w- is now one of my favorite. Oh, The Dirt, I think The Dirt's legit good. No, oh, it's fantastic. I mean, it's not great, but it's it is what it is. It's fun. I haven't seen The Dirt. Oh, The Dirt's the Motley good. Crue movie. It's oh, great. that movie. Oh, that yeah. movie. Yeah, I don't know. I was trying to get Travolta shoehorned <laughs> in there somewhere. Um, all right, so yes. If we don't have cops, we shall have chaos and or we'll just have more Crips and Bloods. Like, I think someone will figure it out. Like the whole deal about policing the neighborhood. Someone's going to police the neighborhood. It'll either be the police or it'll be some other group that springs up that doesn't have a badge, but they're going to police it. Well, and th- trust me, I understand that this is not an apples to apples comparison, but wasn't that sort of looking back the problem with uh, pulling out Saddam Hussein? That yeah. it left this vacuum, mm-hmm. and there's always going to be somebody ready to fill it. Yep. All right. So you're saying Saddam Hussein's like the police? Let's bring him in. Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying, yeah. All right, real quick. Uh, Rob, 35, North Dakota. Oh, Adam, awesome to talk to you, man. Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> Thank you. Listen to the you. book twice already. You listen wow. to uh, I'm Your Emotional Support Animal two times. That is right. Thank you. Obviously, I don't have I don't have much else to listen to. Evidently. <laughs> oh, thank you. Go ahead. Question. Uh, so I was listening to some old love lines, uh, specifically the ones around nine eleven, and then the next day nine twelve. Uh, you and Doctor Drew obviously went off format for a couple of days and just talked about the attack. Uh, you kept reiterating that um, you kept saying, you know, this military gener the military age of this generation they're going to step up they're going to the recruiting stations and they're going to handle their business um do you feel the same way today of like 18 to 25 year olds if you know someone attacked us would they be heading to the recruiting station and doing their business i think probably to a lesser degree i'd like to think they still did but i i think probably to a lesser degree but then if you kind of think about it, the way things are getting becoming kind of mechanized now, we don't need armies, pardon the pun, of people piling to, into the recruiters. We need a bunch of guys who've been playing Fortnite and not getting mm-hmm. laid for the last seven years to go over there and work those joysticks for those drones. So maybe we'll get a lot more done with a, a lot less. I see. Yeah. I- Thanks, Rob. Oh, that does a reasonable answer in a short amount of time. Our uh, guest, Matthew B. Crawford, is uh, on hold. This guy's a man after my own heart, and we'll tell you about him in a second. First, let me tell you something else.
That's about my own heart. Cross rope. Yeah, looking for ways to stay fit while spending more time at home. Cross rope. It's a weighted jump rope system. Makes home workouts fun. I use mine on a nightly basis. No time, no worries. You get a full body workout in just 30 minutes or even less. Combines high intensity cardio with full body strength training. I've told you guys how important it's good to do strength training, but rhythm training is good too. I love I love rhythm and I love balance. And that's that's the thing. You're not just throwing around the iron. You're getting the rhythm and the balance in there as well. It's uh, easy to get started. Just order the ropes and uh, download the app. Enjoy the results. App gives you a free anytime access and uh, it's fun. It presents many challenges, but ones you're up to the uh, you're up to the task to do the six, 60 day risk free trial cross rope. Right, Dawson? If you're ready for a new cardio and full body home workout, visit cross rope.com slash Adam. Get up to forty dollars off cross rope sets plus free shipping when you check out today at cross dot com slash Adam. That's eighty a.m. Cross dot com slash Adam. All right. Quick break. Come back with author Matthew B. Crawford right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Hey, Adam, Josh, and Phoenix. I watched Uppity today, and it was fantastic. Goosebumps, the whole movie. That man is a hero. I watched every second of it Saw after the credits. Fantastic job. Keep up the great work. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Yeah, CNN just did a whole big spread on uh, Willie T. Somebody forwarded me, and now we're getting our deal going with Showtime. And who knows? Maybe it'll all work out. I want to to thank uh, Matthew B. Crawford uh, for being uh, a guest. He's a writer. He's a philosopher. He's a mechanic. As well, which I love. Why We Drive is the name of his book. It's available now on Amazon. Also, as a New York Times uh, best-selling author for uh, the book Shop Class as Soulcraft: An Inquiry into the Value of Work. Uh, I've talked about the value of work. I've talked. I've, 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 this all I do is talk about shop class and work and putting stuff together. So good to uh, good to meet you. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. You have a Ph.D. in political philosophy from the University of Chicago, specializing in ancient political thought. (laughs) We're going to get into that in a second as well, because I got a feeling a lot of this stuff that seems new might be old. Uh, You also explore the ethical and practical importance of manual competence as expressed through mastery of our physical environment. So let's talk about working with your hands and how that pertains to everything in life. Yeah, well, you know, shop class was pretty widely dismantled in this country back in the 90s because we had this idea that we're just going to be gliding around in a sort of pure information economy. Um, but some people, I think, including some who are plenty smart, would rather be learning to build things or fix things. So that bookshop class as soul crap was really a case for the skilled trades and and why uh, a young person might want to uh, consider that as a livelihood. Well, I got to say a couple of things. First off, when all this shit was going down 20 years ago and they were getting rid of the shop classes, I kept saying these PSAs that talked about, you know, hi, I'm Cheryl Crow. We need to fund the music. We need the music back in schools. It's so important to give these kids music class. And I was like, who the fuck is going to be a professional cello player out of this group? But there's going to be a lot of plumbers and there's going to be a lot of electricians. And so they were all concerned Ah, oh, fucking Hollywood and all these assholes. They get everything wrong all the time. They're all in on the music. No one brought up the shop class. And yeah. I think we need to focus on the shop class. But sorry, I'm, I'm agitated. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I mean, we had this kind of dumb idea that there's knowledge work and there's manual work and they're two completely separate things. But uh, I mean, I've worked as an electrician. I've worked as a as a mechanic. And sometimes that kind of work is more cognitively demanding, more intellectually demanding than some of the white collar jobs I've had. I uh, I was just trying to go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say as an example, as a little stupid little example, um, my son, who just turned 14, who hasn't done jack squat his entire life uh, about two weeks ago 
a guy who's been working with me, Peter, said it's kind of in a weird way. I, as his dad, he probably wouldn't have accepted it. Peter was like, hey, man, you got to get to work around here. You can't just putz around all day playing video games and you're going to get paid, but it's not going to be easy. And here's how we're going to break it down. And he laid this whole thing down for this kid who was like formally lazy and he's got him in the backyard and he's swinging a pickaxe and he's raking stuff and he's working a sweat up. And I see him in the evenings when I come home and he's satisfied. He's totally mm-hmm. satisfied. He's telling me he's making seven bucks an hour. He's working six hours a day. This is how much he's going to make at the end of the week. They're taking out 20 percent. They're going to put it in a savings account. He's so different immediately. Just mm-hmm. 10 days of physically moving, sweating, being out in the yard, getting something earning. done, earning like he's proud of himself. He's more confident. Yeah. It's a to- it's totally different than if I said sit in this cubicle and do data entry. Yeah. And also, you know, with that kind of work, you can actually point to it in the world as visible and say, hey, I did that and everyone else can see it. So it's uh, I think it becomes the basis for a legitimate pride, which is very different from the kind of bogus self-esteem that they try to promote in schools as though, you know, this is something you can just give to someone self-esteem. Yes. You have to have the expertise and the accomplishment. And I have also floated this theory on this show, but you're you're a professional, so I'll float it to you. Um, I've been trying to think about why people are so unduly panicked about so many things in our society. So just being scared and saying they're worried about this or they fear that. And I said, we don't have a proper relationship with danger because we're not picking up tools anymore. Mm-hmm. When you pick up a chainsaw or you pick up uh, a nibbler. I love the name of that tool. A nibbler. A nibbler. Nibbler cuts sheet metal. Nibble, nibble, nibble. It's like it's like electric scissors. You have a nibbler? I do. Yeah. Well, you're badass. Do you have an oscillating? <laughs> do you have an oscillating spindle sander? No, I don't. I'm not a wood guy. I'm a metal guy. Oh, okay. Wow. You could. Yeah. You could. Don't try to one up me in front of my crew. <laughs> These people worship me. You. You will get some use out of the oscillating spindle sander with your sheet uh, aluminum as well. But anyway, it um, sounds like a Dr. Seuss piece of machinery. It, oscillating it, spindle sander it is with a Lorax. When you see an oscillating spindle sander in in use, it is exactly as advertised. It's a spindle that spins and oscillates. It's a little bit lewd, I think. It is pretty lewd. Yeah, you put the right attachment on there and and get get enough uh, sangria in you. We got an evening. So so I have a relationship with danger because I use tools a lot. I kind of know what they could do to you, and so I'm always processing that. I'm guessing you do, and I've started to find that the guys I know who work with tools are not freaking out over the same Mm -hmm. things that my white-collar Hollywood friends are freaking out over. Do you think there's a connection? I do. Um, so I, yeah. So back when we were sort of early in the lockdown and everyone was wearing masks, I'm often going into welding supply shops and auto supply places and there, nobody was wearing a mask. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, now they're like, they're, they're forcing everyone to do it. So you don't see that difference as much, but I kind of wondered like, for one thing, these are very small businesses. You don't have this layer of HR, which kind of conditions people to follow all kinds of sort of gratuitous rules, right? Working in a, in a small business, it's, it's all on you. And then, like you say, working with physical stuff is like you have this immediate feedback loop where it lets you know right away if you've gotten something wrong. And it kind of educates your character, I think. Um, yeah, when you're... When you're- you know, when you're I think tr- physical pain is a good is a good teacher. <laughs> yeah, especially if you lose a digit along the way. Like now it's a very good point when you pick up a tool, you pick up a drill and you're going to drill through some metal. And you put the wrong bit, the wrong kind of bit in it and you start to drill the metal, you know immediately you've picked the wrong bit. You'll, it'll feed it right back to you or wood. Like sometimes you'll be pushing and a little bit of smoke will be coming up and you go, this bit's dull. This is the wrong bit. It's not going to work. Like you'll stop and then like it'll physically feed it back to you constantly. If you're trying to cut anything and it's not, you know, it's not really cutting. I had a, uh, I had a guy, Rob, who was doing some cutting for me with a skill saw on the floor 
and he's like, the oak, it's so hard. It keeps smoking the blade. It keeps, it's burning up the blades. And I said, oak's pretty hard. And I'm like, but are you got a carbide tipped blade? And he's like, are you using a plywood blade or a combination blade? And he's like, I got a good, I go, go get a good carbide blade. And he put it on again and he was calling me. He's like, it's still smoking. It's still smoking the blade. I said, it's a brand new carbide blade. Yeah. It's just the oak. Yeah. I said, Rob, is the blade on backwards? No. He said, hold on. Let me look. Yes. He had the blade <laughs> was on upside down and it was not the business side. It, it, it was smoking when you do it. But you'll know immediately if things aren't working. You get that feedback. Right, Matt or Matthew? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's interesting. We're talking about this because um, it. The, the the book Why We Drive really begins from the hunch that risk is somehow importantly bound up with being human. And that's something we're thinking about, especially now, where I think the ideology of safetyism, as I call it, has gotten a little <clears throat> out of control. Um, there seems to be this feedback loop wherein the safer we become, the more intolerable any remaining risk appears. Mm. And um, I see part of, I think that makes us a little more susceptible to the claims made on behalf of automation, right? It's always this promise of safety and convenience. And of course the side effect is that um, it's a kind of de-skilling our skills atrophy from lack of use, mm -hmm. which leads to demands for further automation so you know, if you go far, far enough down this road, I think the whole world starts to look like an assisted living facility, mm -hmm. basically. You ever see that movie WALL-E? Sure. Oh, yeah. Where's that, that scene where they're hovering around in these sort of self-driving pods, staring at their screens, <clears throat> slurping from enormous cup holders. And so these are people who are completely safe and content, but somehow less than human. I mean, you can't. You can't watch that without feeling a certain revulsion. Hmm. Uh, Brian, you had a question? Yeah, Matthew, it sounds like you're talking about like acceptable risk. Obviously, there's an acceptable risk in everything we do, especially in more dangerous things, uh, construction or whatever. If, if I'm reading you correctly, what, how do you determine a level of acceptable risk in, for whatever activity, profession or whatever? Well, people obviously vary in, in, in their acceptance of risk. But it's also true that we all depend on other people taking risks for us. I mean, you mentioned construction mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, maybe you or I don't want to climb a, a scaffold and be in some skyscraper tethered in with a little guy wire and a windy day. Um, but we all depend on the guys who do. So um, there's a there's a weird way in which the, the risk kind of gets offloaded onto a different part of society and may mm -hmm. be invisible to us, especially if you've never attempted that kind of work yourself and have no you know, visceral sense of what's involved. So I think the fact that we now um, kind of tend to outsource so much of our sort of daily physical requirements to other people, whether it's sort of immigrant guest workers or, you know, manufacturing things overseas means we have less acquaintance with this stuff mm. And it facilitates a kind of narcissistic, um, sort of self-deluded sense that we're masters of our world when really we're not. We're, we're dependent. Gina. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure if you have kids or not. And I don't know how far down the child psychology uh, rabbit hole you t you usually go. But mm. uh, kind of off of Brian's question, we he, he and I both have little ones, um, three, four years old. And uh it's a constant debate in this house about an acceptable amount of risk. Like yeah. I don't want him to be afraid of everything, but I don't want him to get hurt. So mm -hmm. do you, do you have any thoughts on that in terms of ra raising little ones? Yeah, I've got, I've got two kids. They're now 12 and 14, but I, I remember that stage when you're, you're just hovering over them constantly and there's this sort of constant anxiety about them uh, hurting themselves. But of course, you know, most of the time they, they fall down the stairs and they bump their head and they're, they're like made out of putty. They seem to be indestructible. <laughs> <laughs> they're not actually, you know, nothing that bad happens. And I think that, that kind of experience of failure when it, when something bad happens to a kid and they, and they get a little bit hurt is an indispensable part of development. Uh, I mean, the child psychologists now will tell you this, 
right? So it's the only way that you kind of learn the limits of your body and develop skill. Mm-hmm. You know, you only develop skill when the world is pushing back against you in some meaningful way. Well, I, uh, you, you know, there's notes of Jordan Peterson and in, in, in these conversations. We've spoken to him about this. I'm a broken record on where's the shop class get the shop class back, get in the garage, get your hands dirty, get busy. Um, there's so, there's so much of an unintended circumstance or unintended consequence, I should say, for us outsourcing everything all the time. And I don't think people, I, I don't think we're prepared as a nation for this. I, I think this sort of onward and upward, you know, we'll get the self-driving cars and then everyone can work from their home and then you never have to go out and, you know, hunt again. The food will be brought to you. It all it sounds it sounds like progress, but there's yeah. going to be a, a fiddler to pay at some <laughs> at some point from a societal standpoint. And I I I think we're going to have to start self-imposing manual labor on ourselves as a society and especially the kids as the same way we do the, I have a rowing machine and a treadmill in my basement. It's a simulation of rowing and it's a simulation of running. And I, we all understand you got to do it. It's, it's too, we're living in too soft a world. You're going to get fat. You got to hit that rowing machine. Uh, I mean, I sit on that rowing machine and I watch a video screen of a guy rowing in real life. (laughs) I've fallen in love with two of my male can't instructors. Get, can't get it up rowing. <laughs> I can't stop thinking about them. But we we understand that with physical fitness. It's all a simulation of carrying a water bucket or bu- hoisting a log and building a cabin or whatever it is. What about the simulation of the manual labor? What about the manual labor? We're going to lose it. Yes. You're reminding me of uh, back before the French Revolution, Marie Antoinette, you know, the, the queen. Right. Uh, apparently used to dress up as a milkmaid and go play at being a peasant. Uh, you, you mentioned that these exercise forms, like hauling jugs of water. It's like, we're, we're living like aristocrats who then need to toughen ourselves up. Oh, is that true? I never, yeah. heard, I, I heard the, you know, let them eat cake famously, but I've never, I never heard that part. Sounds yeah. kinky actually. <laughs> hey, get that oscillating <laughs> spindle sander out them, expat. Let's go to town. Yeah. So what, what would be the plan? So I see my son, he's in the backyard, he's working, a, he's working up a sweat, he's getting paid, he's, he's, he's transformed. He feels mm-hmm. great about himself, like immediately, uh, immediately. What should the schools be doing? Because we're constantly talking about what they don't, and they don't have enough books, or they need a tablet or a yeah. computer, but it's like, I don't know, maybe they need a drill press. <laughs> I don't, yeah, and I, I, you know, I've made the case for bringing back shop class. But I also kind of wonder, does this really have to be in schools? I mean, it used to be things that your dad would force you to do and you hated it, but you learned it. And eventually you had this kind of transformation you're talking about. Um, It's interesting. This this guy named William James, a famous psychologist about 100 years ago, wrote an essay. uh, It was called The Moral Equivalent of War. So what he was arguing that in times of peace and prosperity, when we become so soft, we need some way to keep hardness alive, toughness. And what he advocated was just what you mentioned a moment ago, sort of forced physical labor. He had this idea of basically a national service where people would, you know, get sent off to go logging or cutting, you know, fire trails, um, stuff like that, just as a way of of building character. I mean, it sounds cliche, but it, I think it's really a crucial thing. Well, you know, they started to think about, yeah, what do, what do we need the schools for? Do it for your dads, but think about all in the ever growing population that doesn't have a dad and then yeah. lives in an apartment. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. like you live in an apartment and you don't have a dad. How is this part going to work out? And maybe, Instead of, you know, the after school programs with the basketball courts, maybe we should get some shops up and running in some of those places as well. I don't know. Get Nick Offerman on the blower. Let's get to the bottom of this shit. Well, 
Speaking yeah. of which, we should be killing two birds with one stone and having, uh, having asking our for our kids to be uh, uh, our teenagers to be volunteering for the like Habitat for Humanity, for example, like sure. building things, yeah. doing some more good work for them. My wife did that when she was a teenager, and she, Adam and Gina can attest, she's a woman of high character and high achievement. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of the reason, I mean, it's probably a you know a bit of a self you know self perpetuating cycle, but I have no doubt that a part of a part of the reason is because she built houses for for poor people when she was. 16. You know, I think part of the picture here is that we've got these kind of separate tracks for young people, where if you're on the, you know, the sort of Ivy League track, or or even just the kind of high end college track, your whole youth is spent padding up your resume for that, you know, with internships Mm -hmm. and, you know, little kind of volunteer things, there's a do goodism, start a business online business or something. Yeah, it's all intended to please the college admissions officers. Mm -hmm. So that's the meritocrats who become the managerial class. And so the idea of just kind of uh, hard, unpleasant labor doesn't really fit into that picture, you Uh, know, for its own sake. What what do you think about the psychological implications? Because as as I look around over the last 10 minutes and I've seen all the – Karen's going batshit crazy and everyone on the news going fucking insane, especially over the perception of danger. Like everyone thinks they're in danger. There's nothing going on. They're fucking nuts. And then I look at all the guys I who work with their hands and they have a certain they're even they're level. They're not panicked. They're we. I got a bunch of guys in that shop that are 200 feet away from me uh, who've been working on my cars and working in the shop. Ask me how many COVID-19 conversations we have had. The answer is zero. Zero. Zero conversations about a pandemic that everyone's just been working in. Not even a conversation except for I cannot believe all these fucking people have gone insane. Those are the only conversations we've had. We're going to have there's a psychological implication here and it's going to. It's 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 bad. It's already here. It's, we've already been 30 years of, of this. What what do we do to turn the ship around? Well, the, th- the thing about this whole safety thing is it becomes very moralistic, mm-hmm. right? So if you're out and you're not wearing a mask, there's this kind of virtue signaling, you know. You see people riding their bicycle in the wide open with nobody around with their mask on on a hot day. And I'm like, what are you trying to say? You're saying that I'm I'm a good sort of rule follower, I think. And that's become a pretty prominent part of um, our psychology Brian. Matthew, what do you, what do you think? The, honestly, what do you think? The, who's sending, who is intentionally sending more of a message? Person who wears the mask while biking, which is silly and absurd, or the person who doesn't wear the mask in a crowded place or chooses not to wear the mask when it, it, all logic should dictate you should? Yeah, I mean, it's the, you, you see both, obviously. And it's, it's this delicate thing because I was just reading yesterday about research showing that masks actually they don't stop the really truly tiny particles of virus so there's there's research saying it's, it's probably not that effective but but even if it's not there's this social expectation of doing it so you know I'll put on the mask when I go into a store now you don't want to make people you know anxious people are working there um but uh you know the the virtue signaling seems to be more you know the gratuitous, you know, demonstration of, uh, of being a good, it's the, up, the upper whites and the lower whites. It's sort of like this sort of civil war between the, uh, hmm. yeah. You know. Whitey bookends. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> you guys are all just the pimento loaf between our two <laughs> big slices of wonder bread, bitches. Oh. Get used to it. Uh, yeah, it is. It's funny. It's, it's whites at, at either end of the, the extreme. Yeah. And I think right. we can all agree that, I like to live somewhere in the middle. I'm not, I don't want to hang out with the guy who's jogging alone with the mask on. And I don't want to hang out with the guy who goes, fuck y'all. I'm going into the Trader Joe's with yeah. bronchitis and no mask. I don't want to hang out with either one of those guys. I like, I like, yeah. the, I like the middle folk, but I still, mm-hmm. I still think this danger thing is a is a big issue i think the processing of the fear is a big issue i think the news agencies and the politicians have figured out oh this is a good way to make money and get reelected or get elected so they're all in on this stuff yeah they're all they're all in on the fear and 
it's pretty in, it's pretty insane when you hear politicians speak or you hear news anchors speak how how much you know you know the grim milestone of 132,000 we're 826 and a half we're coming up on that grim milestone it's like it's a grim milestone like you're really going to have to build in a filter everybody you can no longer just sort of take in the information and process it it has to pass through a little HEPA filter that you put in your ears and maybe maybe some glasses with a with a HEPA filter in it as well, because you're going to completely be overwhelmed by it or you need to start a process. I don't know. Go rock climbing or something. Do something that puts a little bit of that into you and that you have yeah. to process. Yes. So uh, in this book, Why We Drive, I, I take um uh kind of these excursions into different motorsport scenes, you know, sort of grassroots motorsports where, you know, it's pretty dangerous stuff. Um, and what you, what was really fascinating about it to me is the spirit of play. I would call it, you know, it's competitive. Um, it's, it's like hostility and friendship combined kind of like, mm-hmm. I don't know, like, uh, think of the rap battles of the nineties, you know, where they're, they're, they're insulting each other, they're boasting. And what makes that spirit of play possible is kind of a willingness to endure risk and tension. And that very much cuts against this, this need to control everything, uh, which I think is very much part of the sort of progressive mindset is, is wanting to sort of rational control and eliminate chance yeah. I mean, this has been the project of kind of social engineering, you know, for a hundred years now. Well, I've always thought part of the problem was with phrases like we have a zero tolerance for mm. zero. What do you what do you mean? You have a zero tolerance for everything, for smoking, not one child left behind, not one like these these proclamations that don't mean anything. And the, the zero tolerance always bothered me. I've never known what the fuck it meant. It always just seemed like posturing to me. Uh, but yes, be prepared. There's going to be some bones broken along the way, and it's good for your kids. I, 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 I think we can all think about instances when we we're young and we fell off the roof or we busted or something playing football or did whatever. Sure. I don't know. I feel like it helped. I really feel like I got something out of a lot of it. I have a, a a good sort of side example of that. A little boy that uh, I was really good friends, you know, just played with all the time in kindergarten, wanted to impress me. He had a little crush on me. So he jumped off the roof of his house onto the driveway and embedded oh tons of rocks into his face he took him immediately to the hospital <laughs> had to deal with all of that and guess what he is today a plastic surgeon wow <laughs> so See? it can send you on the right path that's just good science Gina. <laughs> that's good science <laughs> um also matthew uh we're talking about ancient political thought you have your phd and that is uh well and uh I'm going to put you on my short list of guys I want to get drunk with because I feel like we could really open up a conversation. <laughs> um, what? Let's talk about ancient political thought. What? What's going on now that maybe was going on then or what was going oh, on then? Pretty much everything the same. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I studied ancient Greek thought. So, you know, Plato, Aristotle, that stuff you've probably heard of. Um, so this is the origins of democracy <clears throat> and it's the origins of trying to think through what would be required to have a society that governs itself rather than being governed by tyrants or, you know, some very small elite at the top. And it turns out to require a certain kind of character, the democratic character, and it requires a certain kind of, uh, well, <laughs> Yeah. So the, in, in the Greeks, it, with the Greeks, they actually tied it to like uh, male virtue in particular. In fact, the word virtue comes from the word for male. Yeah. So so courage is yeah, right at the bottom of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. At the top of it. Well, it, it's funny. None of this stuff is is new. And I, I never thought about it. We're all we all think it's a sort of narcissistic thought like, hey, we're alive. It's all happening now. Like what, what we're doing, but you're a human being, you're an animal, 
you're not so different than people were a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago, and your your brain is working the same way. We're having the same thoughts. Everyone's talking shit about their neighbor, or like whatever it is. The same way it sounds. You never see it depicted that way in movies, but we're the same creature. It's a I don't know how much different were dolphins eight hundred years ago. You know, I'm imagining they were in pods doing the same shit they're doing now. You know, and I didn't really know this, but Peter. The guy who's at my house uh, cracking a whip while my son is uh, swinging a pickaxe, he's a philosophy major. He studies philosophy. And so when I would say to him, um, hey, man, I'd start laying my shit out on him. He'd go, yeah, same thing Plato said. And I'd go, huh? Yeah. Who's ripping off my shit? Is that guy stand up? <laughs> what? But it's like, yeah, all these thoughts you're having, they're just the thoughts the guys had long, long before yeah. you. Yeah, lately I've been studying up on the French Revolution because with all the uh, with all the stuff going on now, it seems like we're living through another moment where uh, you know the guillotines are about to come out. So we're well, thinking one already how that... made it out to uh, Bezos's uh, property. What happened? They mocked up a guillotine and they put <laughs> it out front of Bezos's condo. Okay, they were like, "Hey, Jeff Bezos, you guys see that story?" Yeah, oh, I'm I'm oh. not inclined to to laugh too much because it's getting it's getting a little bit real with the, with the get, guillotine reference. It's getting a little bit it's getting a little bit real. Doctor Drew is another guy who's been on this sort of French Revolution um, mm -hmm. he, theme for quite a while. He's been talking to me about this for three years. You know, now it's it's kind of on. But uh, yeah, I think just the other day. Uh, I saw a picture of uh yeah I mean they, they made it out of cardboard cardboard and plywood like it wasn't going to work but it's a it's a guillotine it's a message yeah. undeniable yeah Ooh. support our poor communities not our wealthy men and that was out front of Bezos's um condo I guess or townhome or whatever it was I'm I'm sure he has more than one it was home his but DC a, home his DC home everybody so uh we're getting there or maybe Maybe we're there. Tell us. I've never studied the French Revolution. I always hear it through the th through conversations I have with Dr. Drew. But what have you been drilling well, down? Well, it on? seems like you could call it the first civil war that was ideological, where people got completely inflamed with this idea that half the population is traitors, and uh, and so. The, the sort of the Jacobins or the most radical revolutionaries um, ruled essentially by emergency. It's always an emergency. There's always some hidden plot that has to be, you know, dug up and the traitors executed. And I think we are kind of headed into that territory where um, it's always some moral emergency <clears throat> that requires suspending the rule of law, requires suspending the constitution. And it now seems that kind of the major organs of society have signed on to that, you know, the big corporations and sort of media and academia. Um, so, and you see it also in social media, sort of cancellation culture, right. Where there's just kind of hair trigger people trying to out woke one another and uh, say, you know, where's that divide between the good people and the bad people, you know, right. traitors. So that's pretty poisonous. Well, fear is probably the most prevalent component of human beings. I mean, I mean, a lot of stuff varies. We have a lot of many things vary a lot. Uh, like I really like working with wood and and Matthew likes working with metal and I like working with metal, too. And then I meet many people that much you know, Jimmy Kimmel loves cooking. I love working with wood. I don't love cooking, but we both can agree on fear, right? <laughs> I mean, we don't, no one wants to be taken out to the public square and flogged or having their, have their livelihood taken away from them or shamed or whatever that is. We, we can all agree on that thing. I mean, everyone in a world where everyone has a team and they have their own craft beer they like and they like the vacation in this place and I like the vacation in that place, fear is very universal. And, and, it's, and it works. Yeah, yeah. And it seems like uh, we've become increasingly governed by um, shame in, in this sense. You know, think of just 
the the groveling public apology and yeah. how over the last yeah. I don't know ten years or something that has become such a fixture of public life. Um, there's almost this ritual where you have to grovel and apologize for something totally innocuous. Yeah, there's a kind of willful misinterpretation uh, because it's you can get a lot of power by sort of invoking you know certain nostrums and and shaming people and we just automatically collapse and you rarely ever see anyone stand up and like not apologize right and and articulate why they're not going to right um, so i i think an apology to me so I've, i started to sort of look at this stuff a, a, a little while ago i i had a i had this this sort of watershed moment with my daughter and my wife when they were heading into the car four years ago, maybe five years ago. And uh, something happened in the morning. My daughter was upset and um, I was explaining to her what was going on and they were sort of in a hurry. Nothing worse. I hate when I wish people would either argue or leave. I don't like when they leave and argue. I've had a lot of conversations with people who were arguing toward the car. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't like those kind of arguments. I like a lot of time to argue. But they were like leaving, running late. And I was like standing in the garage. And at a certain point, my wife just yelled at me, just apologize to your daughter. And I said, I didn't do anything wrong. And she said, but she feels that way. That's the way she feels. So if she feels that it must be, so do it. And I was like, I'm not going to do it because if I do it, that's a kind of admittance of guilt. Like it means I did this thing. I don't like the sorry you feel that way, but I never did it form of apology. It's not that satisfying. But to me, you know, if 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 OJ killed Nicole, then uh, he should apologize. But if he didn't, we should apologize to him. Do you know what I mean? He shouldn't go, I'm sorry, but I didn't do this. Or mm-hmm. in any case, or in mm-hmm. any situation, if your if your neighbor accused you of stealing their hibachi, mm-hmm. now come over and apologize. Well, not if you didn't steal it, no. then don't. I mean, yes. well, but where it gets kind of political is when you accuse somebody of, of violating some sensitivity when, in fact, nobody was actually offended. It's sort of play acting at being, being offended just because there's an opportunity to sort of crush someone with, uh, you know, right. with this demand. I, I I agree. It's it's a slippery slope. The politicians have figured out it's good. It's a good way to get reelected. So they're all in. The news outlets have decided this is great ratings. So they're all in. The part that's scaring me is the public. I don't know why the public is all in. I don't know why they're not seeing what's going on while they're sort of aiding and abetting this stuff. Yeah, I don't have any insight on that. It's mysterious <clears throat> how. Uh how public opinion gets formed. I mean, clearly it gets, it's pretty easily manipulated, right? Propaganda works. Of course. Oh yeah. Mass media works. So, um, all right, let's see. Hey, Max Zapata, I want to talk about, uh, I want to talk about cars for a second. Okay. You drive a 70 uh, Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. Yeah. <laughs> it's a ridiculous car to drive around. That's a car Molly Ringwald drove in pretty and pink. What? Oh, as I, <laughs> oh, that, hell wait a minute. Yeah. That is my car. That is your <laughs> that's car. My, that's my, it's red. Same year. So it's also, I'd have, you know, the car Brad Pitt drives in, um, or is it the oh. once upon a time in Hollywood? The great scene. I think. And, so and that, I think as I think about it now, we're just talking about the great Don Adams and get smart. He was always cool. He had a cool car in one season. I think he had a sunbeam tiger. And that on, is a cool car. And the other season, I think he had a Carmen Ghia. Max Pata mm. can look. But now, Max Pata, I, uh, speaking of uh, driving, and, and so tell us your theories about sort of driving and, and danger and, and why you chose driving as sort of a metaphor for this. Well, there was one, there was one episode that kind of where it all clicked into focus for me where um, it was a news report about a, a Google car, a driverless car came up on this intersection. <clears throat> it was a four-way stop. And so it came to a stop and waited for the other cars to come to a complete stop before proceeding through. Uh, but that's not what people do. They don't come to a complete stop. And so the car got confused and didn't know what to do, and it just kind of got paralyzed. And the Google engineer said that what he had learned 
from this episode is that human beings need to be less idiotic by which he meant they need to be more like robots. They need to be strict rule followers. And what, what I found interesting about this is that he was completely oblivious to the kind of uh, what's actually going on at that intersection where, you know, people make eye contact, maybe one person waves the other through. There's always ambiguous cases of, of right of way, but this kind of social intelligence of people working it out on the fly is impossible to reproduce with machine logic. So it was just invisible to him. So his conclusion is that either we need to become more like robots or get out of the way and make room for the driverless cars. And so that seems to be the logic. It's sort of an all or nothing. You can't have driverless cars sharing the road with human beings because these are just two different forms of intelligence. They don't play well together. So, you know, if you think that the mind is basically an inferior version of a computer, this is, this is the road you go down. This is a new improved version of driving. But in fact, I look at that same intersection and I, I'm impressed with what humans are capable of, especially look at an inter intersection in Rome, you know, where it looks like chaos, but in fact, Italy has a lower accident fatality rate than, than we do. They just improvise and they work it out. And to me, that's a picture of a functioning kind of self-governing society. Don Adams and Get Smart drove in season one and two a red 1965 Sunbeam Tiger. A lot of people kind of think of that. And it could have been an Alpina, which is the four-cylinder version of the Tiger. No, that's the Tiger. That has the Ford V8. Ah, you know yeah, how That many? was what made that car special. 260 cubic inches at the beginning. Yep. And yep. then it Up went to 289 later. This is why we're going to get drunk together, Matthew. <laughs> uh, and then season three and four went with the light blue VW Carmen Ghia because Volkswagen became a sponsor. Uh, I will oh. I will concede that as a step down, and I would drive the Tiger if I would, if I could afford one. Sorry, the Car the Carmen Ghia is gutless compared to the uh, compared to the Tiger, but mm -hmm. all good examples of older cars you could have worked on yourself. You know, if you're driving mm -hmm. around a Prius, you can't really get out there and muck pop the hood and deal with it. The Carmen Ghia, you must fiddle around with that thing on a daily basis. I mean, if you're driving it on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. So old cars, they kind of invite tinkering. They invite doing stuff because they're so it's like you just open the hood and it's perfectly plain what everything is and what it does. But in contemporary cars, there's this <clears throat> kind of weird design mentality of hiding the works, you know, as though the, the sight of an alternator might offend us somehow. And some cars don't even have a dipstick. Instead, you're sent an email from somewhere if your oil gets low. Well, that is uh, a little bit creepy. Yeah, that was one of the moments I, I realized I kind of jumped the shark because my dad pulled up in a Audi, I don't know, A3, you know, circa 2011 or something. And he said, I want to check the dipstick, but I can't find it. And I, I gave that, go oh, get out of the way, old man. You don't know, check squat, pop the hood, let Mr. Goodrange find it. And then. I spent 20 minutes looking for a fucking dipstick in this car, and I know where they're supposed to be. So I was really a flummox by it, but I also couldn't envision a car that didn't have a dipstick. Yeah. Like, right. We used to have something called an idiot light, right? And we called it an idiot light for a reason because we had a kind of low view of anyone who was so uninvolved in their car that they let it get to the point that the, the light's coming on. Yeah. But they, there's this weird cultural logic whereby, you know, idiocy, uh, namely being completely clueless, gets redefined as progress. I, uh, Max Zapata, in the other room, there's a picture <clears throat> of me driving in a Trans Am race. And I just had this picture because it's a shot. It's an in-car shot. It's basically what what I see during this Trans Am race that was at the Laguna Seca. And... I just wanted to share it with you because if you look at the speed and you look at which way the wheel is turned, you'll see that it was turn seven at, at, sorry, at Willow Springs. And if you find the speedo, you can find the, 
the speed of the car, but you'll see there's not it's not an oval. It's not a bank. If you've ever been to Willow, it's just a flat. It's a big, long, flat, flat turn. And uh, it's just a cool it's a cool picture that I'll hold up and I'll see. I'll see if it works for you guys. I'll see if you can uh, read it. Um, Why? Oh, we'll put a digital copy up on the up on the screen so you can look into it. The um, how are people? I, I it strikes me that that we're going to just break off and go separate directions. I I, I feel it politically. I feel it spiritually. I feel like, as I've always said, half the group is heading for a safe room and the other half is heading to an octagon. That's that's the way I feel. It's just we're just getting further. And we all we all used to kind of live in the middle because we're kind of forced to. You know, they talk about like, well, where's the middle class, the vanishing middle class? But it's not just the middle class, like for how much money you make. It's like people are just going full extreme. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to load up on guns, and the other one's like, I want to abolish the police, and we're just yeah. moving. And I don't know if you felt people heading toward the garage or heading toward the mechanics bay or or trying to. You know, like almost almost the survivalists are going like, I'm going to stock up on, you know, dried food and cans of water. Like if we is there more of that? Are we seeing a movement toward the garage and toward the wood shop? I don't know. I mean, the you know, the the people who know how to fix stuff are the probably the ones who are going to survive the apocalypse. Uh, <laughs> and those who have a good uh, stock of uh, parts cars parked out back. Um yeah, I don't know. I mean, the the spirit of kind of self reliance, maybe that becomes more appealing in times of of trouble when you don't feel like you can count on institutions to take care of your needs anymore. Um, so, oh, yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Interesting. All right, we have that pick. Sorry, we'll put it up uh, digitally for you. If you wow. if you blow it up, you can see that the speedometer, which is a digital speedometer on the little digital readout dash it'll say five it says, yeah it's fifth gear it's 157 miles an hour and that's into yeah. that turn that car is turning Damn. at that speed and it's not banked it's flat as shit it's all downforce aerodynamics mm. and downforce it's keeping the car stuck to the track but you gotta figure out and have the faith to do that at 157 miles an hour to turn in on that turn i only did it because there's two professional trans m drivers who are ahead of me so i figured you know good enough for them i could i could pull this off but it is uh it is a crazy crazy experience and you are wide awake during this entire experience you do not drift off you don't start having thoughts about uh Trump or Biden you just all you think about is where exactly exactly where you're you're at i would i would recommend some version of that for everyone to uh you mean like keep the like sanity. living your life a quarter mile at a time yes like vin <laughs> diesel <laughs> all right you can take it down max about it but it's kind of cool uh i want to give matthew a, a plug why we drive it's a new book available uh it just came out uh last month yeah about june 9th i think it was yeah yeah available now on amazon and uh also uh he has other books as well should we go to a website should we go to uh, matthewbcrawford.com you may sure thanks uh an interesting conversation we'll we'll continue it uh soon i i hope and uh yeah well, well, we'll both uh, we'll both be the old men uh, screaming at the young kids to uh, fix shit them, themselves. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, thank All you, right. Matthew. Thanks, All right. Adam. We'll take a, a quick break and we'll come back and we'll do the uh, news with Gina Grad right after this.